moving right along with the rest of the show and now jumping into another mini series I guess you can call it of grading the offseason so far in the in the NFL starting off with the NFC North going through some of the biggest moves that they made including the draft free agent signings any trades and re-signing some of their major players all of that is going to be taking into account in these rankings and unfortunately I don't have the graphics as a uh, preface to this segment. I know I usually have the graphics, but it wasn't working for me um, leading up to the episode, so I do apologize for that. I will try to get those back on here tomorrow. So for right now, we're just going to have to talk about it, and we're going to get started with the Green Bay Packers being the first team on here. A grade that I wanted to give them, for me, a C plus. A C plus because I didn't see too much movement, too much adding, and that could be a good thing for some people, but with a young team, you know, surprising a lot of people last year and how good they were. And a lot of people are expecting Jordan Love to take that next step. And I would probably fall in that category as well. But where I'm, you know, sort of lacking behind and not really being too convinced by the Packers as of yet is when you make that transition from being, you know, that surprise team, that young team that nobody expects, once you jump into that second year and now more people have film on you, now more people know what you're about. And you don't make too many changes that really move the needle. You could struggle in that second season. And that's where um, you see that dump off or that downgrade potentially from rookies most likely heading into their second year if they don't live up to expectations. That's usually where you see that. And I know they added Xavier McKinney in free agency to sort of replace Darnell Savage. You had Josh Jacobs signing him to a four-year, $48 million deal, replacing Aaron Jones essentially. Uh, you get younger at that position, but uh, I would like to see a bit more consistency from Josh Jacobs because his first two years, very solid, over a 1,000 yards as a rusher, but the last four years, he's had only one year of a 1,000 yards, and uh, that as a running back, as your number one guy, of course you'd want to most likely split carries with the kind of personnel that the Packers now have available to them, but as that lead guy, especially if you're going to pay him $12 million, you have to see a little bit more consistency. And that just comes down to really staying healthy and producing as that number one back. I think he has improved in situations, so it is looking up for him, but I want to see it now in uh, live games elsewhere in free agency and in this offseason. They lost a starting offensive lineman in John Runyon, so that's going to be a hole that they have to fix. They drafted Arizona tackle Jordan Morgan in the first round, which was questionable I, I saw a lot of reactions from Packers fans that weren't too happy with it so um I don't know too much about him but I know I didn't really see him too often in first round mocks or um just didn't know too many too much about him in the category of offensive tackle you knew about the Tyler Guytons about the Troy Falutanus and those kind of players um the tackle from Penn State as well I can't remember his name but uh, Jordan Morgan didn't really pop up in that, so it makes me think that they reached for him a little bit, and how that turns out in such a crucial position, if he is in contention to start, will be something to watch, and the biggest thing for them, the Jordan Love extension, up until this point, you could look at it as pretty decent if that's the only thing that they have left to worry about, and if that is the only major contract that they're going to have to have on their books, this could be very well, a very good situation for them, but because they haven't done it yet, because it's sort of being pushed off a little bit towards training camp, I'm not left too satisfied. That's why I wanted to give them a C plus. It seems a little bit harsh, but I would have liked to have seen them add a little bit more to this team, especially on the offensive line, because that is a major part to all of this, obviously. And um, they're, I still think they're going to be pretty competitive, but for right now, they get a C plus in my grading. Then we're going to move on to the Chicago Bears, and they fell to an A-minus to me. An A-minus for the Chicago Bears because um, even though it might seem a little over-dependent on Caleb Williams, they did a lot. They did a lot to just clean house, get everything that the, uh, that this new personnel didn't want in there. They took them out and they brought in the guys they wanted, and they were very successful at doing that. So uh, you talk about Caleb Williams, obviously he goes without saying. The franchise quarterback, the generational type of guy that you want in there to flip the organization on its head and really lead you into the next 10 years, hopefully. You drafted Roma Dunze with the number nine overall pick to add to DJ Moore. Then you signed DeAndre Swift to kick off 
free agency and the offseason. $14 million guaranteed to Swift might scare a few people, but um, why... While I do think it's a little questionable, he is still an upgrade, I believe, from what you had last year. Coming off of one of his better years, one of his healthier years in his career, I think that's still an upgrade, and you can't be too mad about it. I probably would have wanted cheaper, obviously, but if it's an upgrade, the way that this has been trending, I think it's still positive for the Chicago Bears. Then, bringing in Keenan Allen, trading for him, giving up a fourth-round pick, I want to say, on an expiring deal heading into the final year of his contract in 2024. If it doesn't work out, you don't get your hands too dirty, and you could just say, you know, we're good. Keenan, you can move on in free agency and sign somewhere else. But for right now, you almost get him as a one-year rental to help out Caleb Williams in his first year. And then after that, if you truly value him, you could re-sign him. That's all well and fine. But if not, he could just move on, and he sort of did his part to help out the Chicago Bears. So... A lot of low-risk moves that I really liked, and also to add on top of that, they re-signed their pro- probably their biggest free agent in Jalen Johnson. They franchise-tagged them so he didn't hit the open market, and then they agreed to a long-term extension, which was fantastic because their defense is their more experienced and more um, developed part of their team with the offense and so many new pieces. They're going to rely on that defense and having Jalen Johnson back is a major contributor to having a successful season on the a success, successful season on the defensive side of the ball. So that's something I'd really like to see. And like I mentioned, a lot of moves that they made were low risk and high reward um, sort of transactions that they had in the off season. And that's what you need in this sort of time when you're trying to flip this organization into a contender. Not being afraid to fail and not being afraid to you know call your shot, go after what you want is something I really liked. Uh, this offseason from the Chicago Bears show. I was left really impressed. They get an A-minus from me. And then the second-to-last team here, the Detroit Lions, in win-now mode, no loggy, no lollygagging about it, no funny business. They get a B-minus for me because um, they're in win-now mode. They're in no messing around. This is all business right now for the Detroit Lions. And I know Making Jared Goff the second highest or I guess maybe the third highest paid quarterback, however um, you determine that, in the NFL at $53 million per year, four years, $212 million as his total contract. Um, Based on just him as a quarterback, is he overpaid? Probably, just based on what he produces. A lot of people will point to the fact that Ben Johnson, their offensive coordinator, should get most of the credit. That could be fair. That could be accurate. But... My biggest point with, you know, finding some validity in this contract for Jared Goff, and I was on the side that, you know, it might be expensive, and I have been on the side of criticizing Trevor Lawrence for not producing just based on his production, earning that contract. I acknowledge that, but the difference here is with the Lions and Trevor Lawrence and how much these quarterbacks are getting paid, yes, they're overpaid in terms of production, but... It is different with the Lions because they're in win-now mode. This is their window to go to a Super Bowl, make some Super Bowl appearances, heck, maybe even win a Super Bowl. This is their time to do it right now. And if that means you have to pay a little bit extra for Jared Goff, you have to do it because you have Amon Ross St. Brown, you have Penny Sewell, you have Jameer Gibbs, you brought in David Montgomery, your offensive line is stacked, Aiden Hutchinson is a stud, Brian Branch is great, Jack... Campbell, uh, I think that's your linebacker's name. I hope I didn't butcher that. You have all these pieces in line to be a great team in the NFC. This is your window now. You have to have the quarterback in place to make this successful. You don't have time to waste trying to look for another quarterback, making this a distraction throughout the entire regular season if Jared Goff is just pouting about it, not happy about his contract situation. You have to get this out of the way to continue this great momentum that you have from last year. And that's different from the uh, from the Jacksonville Jaguars because Trevor and the Jaguars haven't shown any inclination or any thought to anybody that this is their window to win now. Yeah, they've been pretty good in some moments. At the start of last year, they were great, but that sort of died down. And you saw really some of the flaws in this team, and Trevor Lawrence really didn't do too much to supersede that and make himself... Um, be placed in some conversations among some of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. I'm not saying Jared Goff did that, but as a team, the Lions, with him as a crucial piece to it, were able to have a lot of team success where the Jaguars didn't. So that's sort of where it differs with Trevor Lawrence. 
and elsewhere. Uh, they addressed the offensive line even more. They added Kevin Zeitler and uh, Glasgow for their offensive line. They were able to re-sign Amon Ross St. Brown, like I mentioned, and Penny Sewell. Two cornerstone pieces. They're going to be on the team for the foreseeable future. And they addressed defensive back, which I thought was their major flaw in the first two rounds of the draft. Drafting Terry and Arnold, adding Rake Straw, trading for uh, Cortland Davis, Cortland Davis, uh, Carlton Davis, excuse me, trading for Carlton Davis from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So you get three new cornerbacks in there already. And they brought in DJ Reader at the defensive tackle position, which is nice to sort of complement Aiden Hutchinson. But I would have liked to have seen them add another edge rusher um, there. Then they added Marcus Davenport, but we haven't seen too much from him. So outside of that, they did pretty much everything they were supposed to. And how it all pans out and how they put that on to fruition, I think that has earned them at least a B minus because I think I'm being fair there with the contract because it is a lot. It is a lot for Jared Goff, so a B minus is that the grade for the Detroit Lions, which means the last team we're going to talk about is the Minnesota Vikings, and they also received a B minus for me because they also went through a lot of change, but a lot of uncertainty with the health of some of their players that they did bring in. You know, um, they got they were able to achieve the biggest part of business this offseason by re-signing Justin Jefferson, and all while. It was expensive, obviously, now being the highest paid non-quarterback in NFL history. Um, you had to get it done. There's no way you could have had any thought about moving on from Justin Jefferson. And while it is expensive, it could have been even more expensive if they waited until the regular season or next offseason to do something. Getting him at $35 million, I guarantee in a year or two will seem like a bargain because I know some wide receiver out there is going to get more whether it's CD, whether it's somebody else coming down the line, IU maybe, um, I don't know what will some team will pay him, but these guys that need contract extensions, most likely CD, they could get more, and if you think that they're better than Justin Jefferson, not a lot of people do, it'll look like a bargain in the near future, and they also brought in Aaron Jones to have an upgrade at that position because Alexander Madison wasn't giving you too much in terms of production on a low-risk one-year deal at 29 years old, the biggest problem with Aaron Jones is his health, so how he keeps that in check and how healthy he stays will be a major part to all of this. They drafted J.J. McCarthy, obviously, to be their franchise quarterback. I think he'll start at some point this offseason, but they also brought in Sam Darnold as that much-needed bridge guy in case that J.J. isn't ready to start right off the bat. Then on the defensive side of the ball, where arguably they were the weakest, they added Jerry Tillery, they added Blake Cashman, Alex Van Ginkel, Jonathan Grenard to replace Dan Daniil Hunter at that pass rusher position, and they drafted Dallas Turner as well to have a nice duo there on the outside. It's exciting, a lot of new pieces that I think are underrated to help out that defensive, um, run defense, excuse me, especially because that was a major point of theirs, a uh, major flaw, and they added a lot of defensive linemen, a lot of guys that are up in front trying to defend a run. I really liked what they did. I liked the additions, but again, staying healthy if you're Blake Cashman, if you're uh, Aaron Jones, some of these guys that will have to play a major part, Jonathan Grenard as well, they're major pieces, so they have to stay healthy. That's why I can only really give them a B-. minus. If they were, if there were no health concerns, they would probably up to be up to a B plus or a B at the minimum, but I'm still a little weary about it, and I also would have liked to have seen them address the cornerback maybe safety position, so that's where the grades are, that's where they, you know, top off there with the Minnesota Vikings, that's the entire NFC North, let me know what you guys think of the grades, if I was a little bit too harsh, maybe with the Packers, maybe a little bit too lenient with the Chicago Bears, leave your guys' thoughts in the comments during the video or afterwards as well, but we're going to head into another break, and when we return after that, we're going to talk some more about quarterback development, Adam Thielen, seeing some differences already in Bryce Young this year. Why is that a positive thing? What can we take from that? And what was the main reason Bryce Young struggled last year, in my opinion? I will give you guys all that information once we return in just a few seconds. 